All right, Titanic Survivor, we've got a patron request here for a series review. So, as you know, patron, go over there, donate money, request a movie, blah, blah, blah. All right, so we had somebody go in at the uh, series review level, and he picked Wishmaster, which um, has four entries. So you got the first two here. No, I do not have the Vestron Blu-ray. I considered buying it just for this review, but I'm a hard sell on upgrades, I have to say. Like, unless I really love the movie or the movies like this is, but I, on the Amazon right now, it's only like 15 bucks for the Blu-ray sets. I really wanted to do it, but then I was like, oh, I have to wait a few days, and he's already been waiting way too long for these reviews. I already own them. I'm not a big fan of the sequels. So I, you know, I just I couldn't I couldn't uh, I couldn't do it. So anyway, so we got yeah we got we got all the I'm holding them backwards. There you go. So Wishmaster one two three and four. So we're gonna knock these out. Let's start with the first one here. Wishmaster, directed by Robert Kurtzman, the very prolific, very very amazing makeup artist. Um, just he's worked on every damn thing you can ever imagine from Evil Dead 2 to the list just goes I'm not going to go into the list but the dude has worked on so 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 much it's crazy just go if you are not super familiar or not just go to Robert Kurtzman's name and like click on makeup department and click on like FX crew or whatever just click on those two departments and you will just scan, like start at the bottom and just start scanning up. You will be blown away by the Nightmare on Elm Street films, all Halloween, like Halloween 5, Nightmare 5, um, Evil Dead 2. The, it's just crazy when you're just what you're looking at, you're like, holy shit, this dude worked on everything. It's amazing. So. You knew that at the bare, mer the bare minimum that this was going to have fantastic gore and a fantastic practical effects. And absolutely it delivers on that. Now it has some pretty shitty CGI in spots, which is very frustrating coming from someone like this. You would think that this would just be a practical effects showcase. but And they use CGI in certain places where I feel like it's a complete missed opportunity on what they could have done practically. Like, it doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason to it. Like, Kane Hodder's death in this is idiotic. Like, uh, I'd like to see you try to go through me. Like, that was a perfect, it was a perfect moment to have him literally rip through his physical body and, like, from his insides and like have him going through him ripping his whole body apart that would have been amazing but what did they go for instead turning him into a cgi pane of glass and then him like terminator 2 liquid metal walking through him and blopping out and then it shattering and the pieces flying off in different directions like some fucking terrible sci-fi movie why did they shoot a different scene and then just CGI over it because the practicals didn't hold up? Like, what a horrible, horrible decision and what a terrible missed opportunity. You had a you had the ability for this character to literally go through him. It could have been a it could have been a Jesse moment from Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, whether you like that movie or not. I don't give a shit. You're an idiot if you don't, because that movie's amazing. I care what you say, but regardless, the scene where Jesse's in freaking Grady's bedroom. And he cuts through Jesse and he cuts through his stomach and then rips and comes through his body and like just folds him off like he's a Jesse suit is one of my favorite practical effects ever in a film. Like that whole sequence, which was directed by Jack Shoulder, which I've mentioned, part two was directed by Jack Shoulder. Hey, maybe if Jack Shoulder would have directed this, we would have saw something like that. But it was just this amazing, like, I love that shit. That whole scene where he, like, cuts himself open and the head comes through and then he rips himself off. Oh, so great. And it's like, why? Why a CGI glass fucking door? So dumb. All right, so this movie features 
horror legend cameos way before that was a thing. Okay, nowadays it's a thing in every damn movie. Tony Todd and Michael Berryman and Robert Englund and Kane Hodder and blah, 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 the list goes on and on, gets cameos in everything now. Every low budget movie is like, oh, but it has Robert Englund in it for six seconds, so you better pick it up. That shit gets, it's so tired. I'm so over it. In fact, it turns me off, to be completely honest, when I see that there is a cameo from from freaking Sid Haig or something in it now. It's like, I don't give a fuck, man. That just, that just proves to me, like, I get you're playing the game. Like, I get that. Like, oh, you got to put a star in it. It's like freaking Ed Wood talking about trying to get his first movie, Glenn or Glenda, made. And he's like... What would really, you know, make this the biggest box office earner you've ever had? And he's like, tits? And he's like, no, a star. And he's like, I can't afford a star. And he's like, Bella Lugosi. And it's like, why the fuck would Bella Lugosi be in this movie? And it's, it's just that perfect sequence. And that's, you know, from the damn 50s. That's what, that's what I feel like today. It's like, well, we better put freaking Kane Hodder in it. It'll be so cool to work with him. It'll be so cool. And I get it. It's awesome and this and that. But... It's just so overplayed. It's so overdone. I get it. You can get D. Wallace in your movie for six seconds. You can have a cameo from freaking, you know, whoever, Leon, uh, Linnea Quigley or something, whatever. Like I see, I see these people in in, in these low budget movies for five seconds. In this movie, I feel like all the characters actually have their place and they were given good roles. Even though they're like cameo roles, they're cool roles. So you've got Robert Englund in here, who actually plays a pretty decent sized character within this. You've got Ted Raimi in here, who gets crushed by a, a by a you know a big wooden box. Which anytime I see like a guy getting crushed under the weight of something and it actually shows it, is like my favorite thing. I have to say, my favorite one of those deaths would probably be in Final Destination 2 when the kid comes out and the plate glass window falls on him and you just see it. The Final Destination series is far and away the most underappreciated um, horror series when it comes to its gore. The gore in that series is insane and I don't feel like people talk about the wild gore that's in those movies. And that's why I love that series so much is because the gore is out of control insane. And it's just on full display. And I just, I just, I don't feel like that gets talked about enough. But anyway, so you got him. You got Reggie Bannister in here, who dies from cancer. You've got George Buck Flower in here, which, of course, what do you think he plays in the movie? You don't even have to have seen the movie to know exactly what he plays in this movie. Talk about typecasting. Like, hey, hey, Buck, uh, what you, what you doing later? Like, I know you're probably like in a you're probably in your regular clothes right now you're probably looking like a normal person you're at home laying down in your robe and you know watching tv and whatnot but we're gonna have to come have you come down here get all super filthy raggedy up your hair freaking throw you in some dirty ass robes and you know you can just pedal around the street and act like a homeless person again like dude this dude is a homeless guy in every damn movie he's in i feel like i feel like because he's in this and because it's a cameo as a horror icon being in a lot of the carpenter movies that he was in um like the it's almost an homage to his character as well like we can't not have you be a, anything but a homeless guy so you just got to be a homeless guy. Sorry, but you, you just got to be. And then you got uh, Scrim here. You got Angus Scrim here uh, from the Phantasm series as the narrator in the opening. And you've got Tony Todd as uh, another doorman um, along with Kane Hodder, who's a doorman. So you got those two things. And we actually have essentially the same conversation that you hear in Knocked Up. You're just doorman, doorman. Like, that's essentially what the, the Jin's getting at when he's talking to him. It's pretty funny. Um, but that was that was before Leslie Mann. <laughs> but it was, it was very funny to watch. I was like, oh, man, it would be great if he just went off on some tangent about how he was just a fucking doorman. Um, the Tony Todd death is another one that's really stupid to me. Now, here's my question. So in this... We have the Tony Todd thing happen, and he's like, oh, Houdini did that, and Houdini lived way, way, way long ago. 
and he also picks up a cell phone and makes a call and whatever and then he hands her back to her and he's like um, you know amazing piece of technology it's like useful something i'm paraphrasing here i ruined that but regardless he says something along those lines so he knows who Houdini is he knows what a cell phone is he knows all these things he's been in there since like 1100 AD so does he just like upload information like Neo in the Matrix when he comes out like is he instantly just kind of with it in, in the times as soon as he comes out he doesn't have to like run around the city and grab people and be like what year is it like freaking you know Kyle Reese in the Terminator or uh, freaking Alan Parrish in Jumanji like he just instantly knows when it is and how it is and what's going on and what everyone is and like pop culture and I know who Houdini is and it's like, should you? Should you? I mean, if you know who Houdini is, then you should have been able to escape from that uh, opal. Anyway. All right. So then we kind of, we get this opening here that it's like the forging of the one opal. <laughs> I thought that freaking like... Uh, Kate Blanchett was going to come on and start narrating the damn thing. Oh, I need to, I just need to review Lord of the Rings on here. I just need to do it, man. I'm, I haven't watched them in so long and they're my babies. They're just sitting right here behind me too. All six of these beauties right here. Just, just, they need me. They need my love. I haven't watched them way too long. It's a shame. They're my favorite fucking movies of all time. And I haven't watched them in a couple years now, maybe two or three years. That's sad to say. I usually watch them at least once a year. All right. Um, so after the forging of the one crystal, um, we've got this this party that goes bonkers, and and the practical effects on display here are awesome. Especially the dude who like rips out of his body with his skeleton. And the skeleton rips from his body. Amazing. And to see that, and then to fast forward to the broken cane mirror is or a door glass door or whatever is just insulting it's like no god no awful so then uh, the um so the sorcerer makes this this uh this what is it it's it's a it's an opal freaking crystal is it a ruby i don't know what the hell it is but it's she says it's like a fire emerald or i can't remember it doesn't matter it's a crystal so he, he makes this crystal to trap the djinn in there. And then the crystal is, takes on its own properties. It's almost like a, it's almost like a fable, like a, like a freaking Disney movie, you know, or something with like Cinderella where it's like, by her 16th birthday, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like this prophecy that has to be um, fulfilled. <laughs> the prophecy fulfilled. Uh, I wonder what happens in this one. But yeah, it's it's just like oh well, from because the before that there was no crystal, so the, he creates the crystal, and then what she's reading about in the movie is what he has to do to gain his power back. So I guess with the crystal he had to set parameters. That was like part of the curse. Like the dude, the the gin itself was power, like was so powerful, it, and in order to trap him in this thing, he had to give out rules in order for this thing to work. So it was like, all right, he has to collect souls, which will then charge the power of the crystal, which will give him enough power to then have to have the person who woke him from his slumber make three wishes, and then he has enough power to like wipe out the earth. Why do they just want to wipe out the earth? What are they going to do with the earth once it's wiped out? Like, are they just going to start it fresh and new? Or are we going to like start from scratch and, and, you know, like human race, let's wipe them out and let's try again. Like they, they're done for like, what does everybody want to kill the earth? Like what's, what, what do you gain from killing everyone? Like I could understand, like he wants it for ultimate power. So everyone will bow to his feet and women will, you know, become his sex slaves and stuff like, like that is speaking my language. Not that I want women to be my sex slaves, but you know what I mean? A crazy me would want that. I'm kind of crazy though, so hmm, no, I don't want that. Um, unless they're willing sex slaves, and they're like, "Oh, Jason, I want this. This is what I want. This is what I personally want." <laughs> I was about to go off on some tangent there. 
but we're gonna we're gonna spare you guys my fantasies, my freaking <sighs> Uncle Willie Demon Knight fantasies. All right, um, and all right, moving on, moving on. Where the hell are? Oh, please take present day out of movies. That's so stupid. It ages any movie. Present day, really? Is it 2019? I said this in the past. It's so silly to me. They do it in freaking Friday the Thirteenth. So when I watch Friday the 13th, when it cuts to 1980 and it says present day, I'm supposed to be like, it's present day? Like now? Like 2019? So Jason's mom would be like 150. So she looks pretty damn good for that age. Actually, she doesn't. She, Betsy Palmer was not a not an attractive woman. Not then, anyway. Not in that movie. Uh, I don't know what she looked like before. All right. So, uh, so we got our main girl here who I like. I like her. Um... She's yeah, she's pretty. She does a good job in the movie. Um, she's not like overly remarkable in any way. I wouldn't say she's like gorgeous, and I wouldn't just say she's like an amazing actress or anything. But she's pretty, and she's fine. Like she's just kind of fine. Um, so I like her. Um, so she's there. She plays tennis with her buddy, and her buddy's like, "Hey, you want to maybe like fuck later, and then like continue fucking, and then like." just like continue to keep doing that like boyfriend girlfriend kind of thing because that's how you ask people out um because relationships are just purely about sex that's all that <laughs> okay being serious here but he asks her out she's like i don't want to fuck up her friendship so that begs the question can men and women actually be friends like really can they be oh i think they can but it really depends so yeah that, that's the problem, and, and of course, if you've ever dated a friend, if you've ever dated a colleague, if you've ever dated a coworker, you know what a risk that is, because if it goes sour, it is very hard to reconcile your differences once said arrangement has been null and void. So once you're kind of outs with one another, it's hard to just go, okay, we're going to be friends again, and I'm going to watch you fuck the dude and you know who works on the fry side of the, of the restaurant. Like, That's probably not going to go over so well with me now that I've done that with you. So, yeah, it's hard, man. Dating, like, friends, having a chick friend, especially when you're single, and especially like when you have an attraction to her, or if she is attractive, or if he's attractive and you're a chick, or if you're a guy and you're into dudes, or whatever the fuck the scenario is. It's difficult, man, and it's just, you know... Okay, anyways, I'm going to freaking wax intellectual here about relationship drama and advice. What the hell am I talking about? All right, talking about more about horror movies. Let's get back to this shit. The auctioneer guy in this movie that she works for or whatever, is, I, I really like him. He's pretty funny. Um, we got a little baby gin in this movie that crawls out. Oh, he's so cute before he tries to kill the world. Um, and then the bum here kills the clerk, so that's the, the Bannister Buck moment, and he, like, instantly rejects it and, and, and uh, you know, regrets it and runs off. Uh, but it doesn't matter because they all end up dying. But then they all end up not dying because this whole movie is then taken away later on. So she saves everyone who dies in this movie. She ends up saving with her wish. So she, she, um, she like, freaking endgamed them right back into this um and then i like that he cuts a guy's face off and then just puts it on it like morphs around his face and he can just like, like he can't just make himself look like somebody he actually has to cut someone's face off and actually wear it like leather face except for he doesn't look like a freak in a leather mask he actually looks like the actual person so you've got the uh, the actor here um andrew no is that is this div off in this one or whatever um yeah whatever anyway so i like yeah he he puts it on he becomes the guy and yeah andrew Div divoff i never know how to say that guy's freaking name um because he's i want to say he's it's the same guy in the second one but then i think in like the third and the fourth it becomes somebody else um yeah we'll see I'm, I'll, I'll look into it later okay um, but yeah, it, it was a clever way to get the actual actor who's portraying the gin under the heavy prosthetic makeup to be in the film. I like that England has a Pazuzu statue. That's the reference there to the exorcist. Good stuff. Um, I like that. I like the joke that he goes to try on a suit 
And she's like, maybe we can get you something tighter. And he's like, no, it's too restrictive. I've had enough of that. Like, I don't, I don't want to feel restricted anymore because he's been living in a lamp. Itty bitty living space. Um, I actually referenced the uh, Aladdin, the, the, the Robin Williams Aladdin here, as well as uh, freaking I Dream a Genie and everything. Uh, I thought that was cute that they... I, I was like, oh, wow, this, I, yeah, I guess this did come out after uh, Aladdin, the original animated Aladdin. Um, the police station criminal show where the dude rips his jaw off and everything. That whole sequence is badass. That guy's wish. And I say wish very loosely here because this movie does not, like, you just have to say you want stuff for it to be a wish. Like, that's some, that's some loophole bullshit right there. I'd be like, dude, I just said I was hungry and I want a sandwich. I should lose my soul for that. Like, that's not what exactly happens in this movie, but not far off. I mean, he could have just waited around for a guy to say literally anything. He baits them into it, okay? Like, if they took this to gin court, that would be entrapment. So... You know, for a guy who's been trapped in a crystal for so long should know about entrapment. Like, that that's some thin shit to be like, like, oh, well, uh, what do you want? And he's like, I want this. That's not a wish. That's not a wish. I want things all the time. I ain't wishing for him. If I'm going to wish, I'm going to wish big. And speaking of wishes in this movie, so the dude wishes for a million dollars. And so that makes his mom get on a plane signing a life insurance policy for a million dollars the plane crashes so here's the thing though in order this scene makes no sense so in order for him to actually give the information on his on his uh on his worker there that he's that he's there for he wants to be able to find this guy so he has all this power but he can't find this girl he he can't just figure out where she is he can figure out everything else but he can't figure that out whatever it doesn't matter but so he finds out where this guy is he kills kane hotter in a really dumb way and he comes in there and he's like what can i give you that will get me the information that i need okay i want a million dollars wouldn't he have to actually provide him with the million dollars for him to give the information over he would have never even gotten contacted about the fucking plane crash until hours later. And then, in addition to that, like, finding out about the policy and then actually getting the money would take probably a year or more. So... I find it very weird that he's like, oh, and it's like, oh, it's this clever little bit of writing. Like, oh, we're going to have his mom sign this insurance policy. But how did he prove to him that he was getting that money? Did he show him? Like, I don't, that makes no sense. It cuts away because there's no explanation for it. It's stupid. So I thought that, I thought that was really dumb. A really dumb moment in the movie. It's a silly movie anyway. So of course I'm being ridiculous here, but I just was like... That makes no sense. Um, but what if he hated his mom? That's not much of a punishment. If he, if he hated his mom, he'd be like, good. Like, my mom's dead and I get a million dollars? I didn't make two wishes. I only made one. So that, you know, you never know. I'm guessing he loved his mom if that's the route that they went. And thirdly, I'm, de- I'm thinking about this way more than I probably should. But what would he have done to get him a million dollars had his mom not been getting on the plane then? It was like a serendipitous moment that he just so happened to scan. So he can find his mother all the way across the country or wherever the hell she was. I guess she could have just been right up the street at the airport. We don't really know where she was leaving from. But she can, he, can find, he can know who her mother is and then attack the mother. But he can't find the, dude, the chick who released him from his prison that makes no sense whatever doesn't matter but like was she meant to be like was all of this fate and if it was fate then was she meant to wish the way that she did to put him back in whatever but like she had to be there in that moment just so happened like like coincidentally enough she had to be getting on a plane right in that moment so her life 
led up to that moment where there would be that opportunity to serendipitously put the million dollar life insurance policy in front of her in that very moment that he wished for it. See what I'm saying? As I said, way overthinking things, but I just found that to be interesting when I was watching it. All right. <clears throat> Moving on. <sighs> and he gets hundreds of people killed. Let's, let's keep that in mind. So even if you did want your mom dead, you probably didn't want the couple hundred people on the plane to die. So bad wish. Although it really wasn't a wish. He just wanted a million dollars. I want a million dollars. I don't want my freaking, you know, I don't want a loved one to die for it. I just want the million. Just give me the million. I don't want any repercussions for it. Just give me the damn money. Um, all right. <clears throat> and we talked about all that. We find out that she can't kill him. He even gives her a free wish. All right. This is like, this is a, like Aladdin trickery, except for the gin is in on it this time. All right. No more freebies. I love Aladdin. All right. Um, and she wants to know her enemy. So she's been listening to a lot of Rage Against the Machine lately. So her first wish is, I want to know what you are all about. And he kind of tricks her into his world, and then she has to wish her way out. So her first two wishes are gone, like, almost instantly. And then, and then she goes to this party, and, um, she then sees this absolute massacre and yet again another freaking special effects extravaganza which is like two a opening party and then a closing party both with insane practicals awesome stuff um and then i guess uh we need like alcohol can can put a new warning label on there do not operate heavy machine or alcohol or but especially alcohol because of this movie but yeah there there is a warning label for you do not have do not operate heavy machinery under the influence of this or you may set a gin loose on the world who is freaking you know set out on on total destruction of the earth so that might that might kick you back a little bit like i probably shouldn't go to work drunk this day so uh today so then, yeah, she makes the smart decision here and wishes that guy to not be a total drunk lunatic who uh, drops a package on somebody's damn head. Um, so yeah, fun movie, man. This is such a good one. I know it's all downhill from here. I'm looking forward to it, though. I haven't watched two and three in a while, and I don't, or three and four in a while, and I barely, re I don't remember. I remember he's in prison in like three or four and or maybe that's the second one i don't remember man i just remember that two that three and four are just dreadful and two was watchable so hopefully my opinion changes my, my opinion has changed on a lot of movies over the years that i've been doing this channel over the years two years um i really liked actually like all the pup uh pumpkin heads i liked all the hellraisers except for hell world there was a movie that I went back and I rewatched the whole series with more of an open mind and watching them back to back. And I was like, I actually like these. They're bad. I, I have always shit on these. But I'm glad I went back. Psycho 4. I've had a lot of examples where I've went back and, and done this. So I, I like this. So thank you to Titanic Survivor. Um, and I will get to two soon. But anyway, guys. Adios.